For a couple of lectures, we're going to be discussing now the hydrogen atom. So you've seen the hydrogen atom before. You've seen it in 804. You've seen it in 805. Why do we see it again in 806? Well, the hydrogen atom is a fairly sophisticated example. It's the harmonic oscillator of atomic physics. If some of you are going to be doing atomic physics eventually, uh, you have to understand the atom perfectly well. The energy levels, the degeneracies, why are they? How do you separate the levels? How do you split the degeneracies? Uh, it's a fantastically good example of uh, perturbation theory. Our degenerate perturbation theory, uh, non-degenerate perturbation theory in some cases, but overall, it's a very important physical system in, that affects many areas of physics. Uh, astrophysics with hyperfine splitting, uh, all kinds of processes uh, in atomic physics, in lasers, and things like that. Uh, so it's something we really want to understand well. And this time, in 806, uh, it's the right time for you to understand the fine structure of this atom. Bits and pieces of this have been done before, but uh, now we're going to do it in detail. So let's start with hydrogen atom, fine structure. Hydrogen atom, fine structure. That is the main topic for a couple of lectures. So in terms of uh, Hamiltonians, we've been talking of an unperturbed Hamiltonian, an H0. This Hamiltonian is known. It's the momentum squared over 2m minus e squared over r. Here, um, this is the momentum in three dimensions, the three-dimensional system, of course. This m is the mass um, of the electron times the mass of the proton divided by the mass of the electron plus the mass of the proton. And that's the reduced mass of the system, but it's approximately equal to the mass of the electron. Um, so we will, whenever we write m, it will be the mass of the electron. Oh. Now, if you happen to have a nucleus with z protons, what you have to do is replace this e squared by z e squared. And this is because the factor of E squared comes from the product of the charge of the electron times the charge of the nucleus. So if the charge of the nucleus becomes Z times bigger, uh, this E squared is replaced by this quantity. What uh, important uh, length scales exist here is the Bohr radius. This is the most important length scale, and uh, it's constructed with the quantities that appear in this Hamiltonian and h bar. So in particular, it doesn't involve the speed of light. There's nothing uh, in this system that is relativistic. So this quantity is h squared over m e squared. And uh, this, that this has units of length is something that uh, you should be able to derive from here in a few instants. Uh, please uh, make sure you know how to derive it without having to count mass, length, time units here. This is something you should be able to do very quickly. Uh, one piece of intuition, of course, is that the E appears in the denominator which uh, is the intuition that as the strength of electromagnetism is made smaller and smaller by letting E goes to zero, the orbit of the electron would be bigger and bigger. So this is about 53 picometers, 
where a picometer is 10 to the minus 12 meters. It's a nice unit. Uh, it's half an angstrom, roughly, but uh, picometers is the right unit for people that think of atoms. Then the energy levels are given by minus e squared over 2a0, 1 over n squared. This is a beautiful formula in terms of uh, quantities that you understand. First, the energy just depends on n, and is 1 over n squared. And n is called the principal quantum number. Principal quantum number. And it goes uh, from 1 up to infinity. This has units of energy, and that's why this is nice, because uh, E squared over R is the units of potential energy in electromagnetism. So when you see this, you know that this has the right units of energy. And uh, for the ground state of hydrogen, N equal 1, that energy is about minus 13.6 EV. Now, in terms of uh, thinking ahead for perturbation theory, some of the perturbation theory here uh, will reflect the fact that electromagnetism is weak, and the other fact will reflect that uh, the electron is actually moving with slow velocities. So let's see these two things. First, we can write the energy or um, in terms of the fine structure constant. So alpha, which is the fine structure constant, is e squared over hc, if the units we're working with, and it's about 137. So whenever you see e squared over a0, which is a unit of energy, um, you should realize that that um, if you wanted to change that, for example, for the case that you have a nucleus with z protons, you cannot just do e squared going to z e squared because, in fact, a0 itself has an e. So uh, don't think that the energy depends like e squared. It actually depends more like e to the fourth times other constants. So let's do that. Um, so we have here m e to the fourth over h squared using the value of um, a0. And then we can use um, e to the fourth from this equation. So it would be alpha m alpha squared h bar squared c squared over h bar squared. And is equal to alpha squared m c squared. A nice way of thinking of the ground state energy of the hydrogen as a small quantity, alpha squared, times the rest energy of the electron. After all, the system begins just with an electron, and it has some rest energy. And uh, there should be a natural way of expressing this. Of course, you know, you start seeing the c squared here, but the c squared really is nowhere there. We've put it for convenience, but it allows us to think of scales, and in particular, the rest mass of the electron is alpha, is much bigger, because alpha squared is about 1 over 19,000. 1 over 137 squared is about that. So the energy En can be written in a way that we will use often as minus 1 half alpha squared mc squared 1 over n squared. All right, and another observation, um, the momentum P 
of the electron, we could estimate it to be h bar over a zero. So this is m e squared over h bar. And we use e squared for what it is. So this is alpha, well, well I'll put it all m, alpha hc over h bar. So this is alpha mc. It's a nice thing, uh, alpha mc. It says that the, the momentum that you could construct relativistically, the mass of the electron times the velocity, you still have to divide by 137. But it's clearer if you write it like m alpha c. And then momentum, which is mass times velocity, at least for so slow velocities, now is mass times alpha times c. So the approximate velocity that we estimate on the electron is c over 137. So that's very nice. It's kind of non-relativistic. OK, so this is the basic things. But uh, the most important stuff is really getting the table of how the atom looks. So this is still review. Uh, half of this lecture, in a sense, is review. We put here, not in scale, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and n equals 4. In reality, the hydrogen atom, if this is zero energy, and this is the ground state. The ground state is here. The second excited state is here. The third is here. The fourth is here. Fifth, is, they all accumulate here. But I, I've written it this way. Now, uh, we'll have L equals 0 here, L equals 1, L equals 2, L equals 3. And uh, there is a, another notation uh, for these states. Uh, I don't know why, but there is. A capital L that is a function of L. So capital L of L equals 0 is called S. So um, these states are called S states. Capital L of L equals 1 is called P. So states with L equal 1 will be called P. Then D and F. These are names. People use those names. Uh, they're OK. And here are the states. For n equal 1, there's just one state here. Uh, for, and here, there's one state as well. But for n equal 2, there's a state with L equal 0, and there's a state with L equal 1. For n equal 3, there's 0, 1, and 2. For n equal 4, there's 0, 1, 2, and three. So these are the states in the spectrum of hydrogen, it's something that we should know very well. And uh, what are the patterns here? They're degeneracies. Why? Because uh, when we talk L equal 2, for example, that means a multiplet of angular momentum with total angular momentum 2. And that comes with azimuthal angular momentum that goes from minus 2 m values to plus 2, that is five states. So in principle, each bar here is five states, five states. L equal 1 has m equal 1, 0, and minus 1. So three states, three states, three states. And here really zero states. So there's lots of degeneracy. That's why. We spend lots of time studying degenerate perturbation theory because there's gigantic degeneracies here. So to determine the origin or the way we parameterize the degeneracy, there's just one formula that says it all. And that formula is for degeneracies. See? It's the formula that explains it all. And it says that the principal quantum number is equal to capital N plus L plus 1. 
per n is the degree of a polynomial in the wave function. Wave function. L is the orbital angular momentum. So uh, this says, for example, that this degree of the polynomial n can be 0, 1, 2. It cannot be negative. L can also be 0, 1, and go on. But here, for example, you see the main rule that for a fixed n, you can have L equals 0, 1, to up to n minus 1. Because by the time you take L equals to n minus 1, this whole thing is equal to little n, and capital N is 0. And that's as far as you can go. So the angular momentum cannot exceed the principal quantum number minus 1. That is what we see here for n equal 3. You can have up to L equal 2 for n equal Four, you can have up to L equal three. So this is kind of well known. Now for each L, each L, you have M from minus L all the way to plus L, and that's two L plus one values. So the degeneracy at n at the principal quantum number equal n is the sum from l equals 0 up to n minus 1. Those are the, all the possible values of l of the number of states in each l multiplet. And you've done this sum before, and that actually turns out to be equal to n squared which says there should be four states at n equal 2. Indeed, one state for s equals 0. Three states here is 4, 1, 3, 5. Uh, it's that property that the sum of consecutive odd numbers comes up equal to a square, a perfect square. It's a very nice thing, geometrically. So the wave function will write it here, the wave function, psi n l m. These are our quantum numbers. n, principal quantum number. Once you know n, you know the sum of capital N plus L. But L is a little more physical than n. So um, we'll use L. And once you know L, you still need to know for a given state which value of m you have. So those are your three quantum numbers. And this wave function goes like a constant times r over a0 to the L times that polynomial we spoke about, 1 plus beta r to the r over a0 all the way up to a number times r over a0 to the capital N. Times e to the minus r over n a0 times y l m of theta and phi. So that's your wave function. Those numbers I have not determined. I have not determined the normalization. But if you're looking at a wave function, the easiest place to see the principal quantum number is here. The easiest place to see the orbital angular momentum is here. You identify it from here. It must be multiplying a polynomial that begins with 1 because the leading power in the solution must be r to the l, and has degree n here. 
And the m quantum number, you see it from the spherical harmonic. So in particular, here you have a state with L equals 0, N equals 1. So this must have N equals 0. This must have N equals 1, because you must get to 2 with a capital N, and L equals 0, and a 1 there. So this is N equals 1. This would be N equals 2, N equals 3. Similarly here, N equals 0, N equals 1 n equals 2, n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 0 here. The n's decrease in this direction as L increases, keeping the sum of capital N and L constant and equal to little n minus 1. Interestingly, uh, this makes sense as well, if you may remember, the Quantum number n, capital N, tells you the number of nodes of the wave function because a polynomial of degree n can have n zeros. And therefore, this wave function has no nodes, one node, two nodes, three nodes. The number of nodes increase. That's another thing that wave functions should have. So a couple more comments on this. Uh, will um, write, I'll write the, the ground state wave function, I'll put it here, I'm cluttering things a little bit, but the ground state wave function is one that we can have and normalize uh, easily, square root of pi over a0 cubed, e to the minus r over a0. That's the ground state wave function. OK, comments on this thing. First, there's a very large degeneracy here. And it has a nice interpretation. This corresponds to states with different values of the angular momentum. Semi-classically, if you were doing Keplerian motion, and think semi-classically of the electron orbit, all the orbits here correspond to orbits of the electron with the same semi-major axis, but with different eccentricity. So as it turns out, the orbit with least L is the most eccentric of all orbits. And as you go in this direction, the orbit becomes more and more circular. So if you want an immediate intuition as to why are all these states distinguishable, it's because they are orbits with different eccentricity. There are ellipses with different eccentricities, all with the same semi-major axis. So it could be a circle like that, or it could be just an ellipse like that. So those are it. Um, then, uh, most important complication we've ignored here, it's the spin of the electron. Electron has spin, so we know the spin of the electron represents a degree of freedom described by a two-dimensional um, vector space. So there's two states in every one of these. So uh, we will have to consider that. And uh, if I want to put the number of states on each one, here there was one state we said, but now we know there are really two states. And here there's two states, is L equals zero. Two states, two states. Here is L equal one. That's three configurations of orbital angular momentum. But the electron has, again, up or down possibilities. So these are six states, six states, six states. L equals two is five states. But with the electron, there is 10 states and 10 states here. Um, in this one, L equals three is seven states to L plus one. But with the 
electron degrees of freedom is 14 states. So these are the right number of states. When we'll do the fine structure, we'll have corrections due to the spin and corrections due to relativity. Both things will make our corrections. And by the time we do that, we may also want to explore the atom by putting it in an electric field. That's the Stark effect. It will change the energy levels, and you learn more about the energy levels of a system. You can put it in a magnetic field, and that's the Zeeman effect. And the magnetic field can be weak, or it can be strong, and it's a different approximation, and there's uh, several things we have to do with it. <clears throat> 